grab a drink before uh, we all sit down. We'll, we'll make a start again. And so, um, my name is Otene Rewiti, and my role in tonight is to open open our conversation up again, uh, just with a short blessing, and to acknowledge. Um, Our guest that has arrived here uh, from the UK, I will welcome her in our Māori language, uh, this to uh, in the language of chiefs. Um, so to acknowledge her, we'll uh, yeah, I'll do a little welcome. So, Nurega Tina Kato Katoa. We'll just we'll just start and we'll. Uh, I know there are people, people moving around, but that's that's fine. So the karakia that, that, that I will do tonight is, is again, the, the karakia for the baskets of knowledge. And as you know, um, there's a proverbial saying, no te rauro, nā ku te rauro, ka ora e te iwi. With your basket of knowledge and my basket of knowledge, uh, the people will thrive, the people will live. And so today, as we fill our baskets with some more conversations that are happening tonight, um, those baskets will be used to um, make, make Tamaki Makoto a better place. Your part again in this karakia is when you hear the phrase tuturu whakamoa ka tina, your response is tina, so okay, here we go, tuturu whakamoa ka tina. Okay, yes, Tina's quite dead. Quick Tina sounds a bit tired, <laughs> after five, a bit run down, and, but we, we need Tina to be on her game. So uh, Tina needs to be here at six o'clock, so we, we're calling out to Tina. So we'll do that again. Tuturu whakamaua kia Tina. Tina. That's a better Tina. I'll turn up to that Tina rather than the other one. Uh, Tina, homie who ye and your response is taiki so normal responses, so if you come, you'll know. Uh, those are our responses for this. One, I know that you're awake. Two, that you haven't fallen asleep during my karakia. And three, all, all that means is let it be, let it happen. I agree with that. So here we go. Kainoitato, let us give thanks. Our karakia begins. Teneo, teneo, ko te hōkai nei taku tapu wai. Ko te hōkai nuku, ko te hōkai rangi. Ko te hōkai ātō tūpuna tāne nūrea ārangi. I pikiti ai ki ngā rangi tū haha ki te tihi o manono. I roku hinga tūrā, ko i o matua kore ana kē. I rirui hoana nā kete o te wānanga. Ko te kete tūri, ko te kete tūatea, ko te kete aramui. Kā tiritiri a kā paupaua ki a papatua nuku. Kā puta teira tangata ki te whai au. Tuturu whakamaua ki a tina, haumie huie, taiki e. Nō reire e ngā mana e ngā reo, rauranga tirama. Haere mai nau mai ki tēnei wahi me ki ana mātou i ngā rā o mua. Ko kuru kotoa tēnei, kuru kotoa. Ingari i roto tenei rangi ka ki au haramai ki tāmaki makaure. Tāmaki herenga waka, tāmaki herenga tangata, tāmaki tāmaki ko karanga nei ki a koutou. Nau mai haramai whakatau mai. Haramai i roto te tai pari, te tai tsimu o te wai te mata e haere ki ki tā wahi e hoki mai mai te rā mai te moana nō reira tēnei te mihi ki a koutou kua tā mai e te manuhiri tu a rangi kua tā mai nau mai, hara mai whakatau mai, mauri a mai ngā kete mā tauranga ngā kete kōrero o ngā mātua o ngā tūpuna hei hei hina ki mā tātou nō reira I roto tērā kāhuri taku reo. Greetings this evening and welcome to this place that we call Tāmaki. Tāmaki Makaurau, the place where 
the waka gathered, and we can see all the beautiful boats out here. Tamaki, the place where people gather, and we're gang people are gathering here this evening to start another conversation. And so we welcome you here. We welcome you once, twice, three times, and especially from our traveller from afar. We welcome you to this land, to this place. Uh, my people used a saying of Ngāti Whātua, he aha te hau, we were wara, e were wara. He tiu, he raki, he tiu, he raki. Nā nā ia mai te pūpū taraki hi kiuta, e tiki nā tu e au te kōtu. Ko ia te pau, te pau whakairo ka tu, ki te waitamata. What is this wind of change that is blowing from the northeast? And so today, in my welcome, I say, what is this wind of change that is brought? And it is you who come here to talk to us and bring the models of the United Kingdom amongst us today, the healthy streets, and to begin a conversation with us today. So welcome, welcome once, welcome twice, welcome three times. Nō reira, i ngā mana, i ngā reo, rauranga tira mā huri nō, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā tātou katoa. I'll let Ludo um, sing the song for you later on, I'm sure, so I'm going to hand over to you, Ludo, is that right? So, no mai, ara mai. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, uh, kia ora tātou katoa. Thank you, Atene. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, um, my name is Ludo Campbell-Reed, and um, on behalf of the Auckland Conversations team, um, a really warm welcome to tonight's Auckland Conversation. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm the General Manager of the Auckland Design Office. I'm also Council's Design Champion. And um, Auckland Conversations is this exciting program, and it provides the opportunity to uh, to inspire, to educate, to upskill, and I guess stimulate your thinking. So that's really the aim of tonight in terms of the future challenges that Auckland is facing. Um, and tonight we're really, really privileged to welcome a public health uh, specialist, Lucy Sanders, to, 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 and some panellists as well to talk about healthy streets for Auckland. So that's the, obviously the theme for this evening. Um, thank you for all of you for turning up. It's a really great crowd. There's about 450 of you. Um, thank you to the councillors. I see Councillor Chris Darby is here tonight. Um, Pippa Coombe is here from the Watamata Local Board. And of course, Richard Hills, Councillor Richard Hills, is also here to uh, be part of the panel discussions later on. Um, look, first, a few housekeeping um, issues. Um, in the unlikely event of an uh, emergency, an alarm will sound and uh, will be directed by the team out of the building and by the ushers as well. Uh, bathrooms are located just outside of the, the room, just through the doors to the left and to the right. And uh, finally, if you would be grateful, I mean, you can keep tweeting and so forth, but please turn off your phones and the notifications because uh, that can be a bit disruptive. So I think I better turn mine off here <laughs> before I trap myself. Um, so look, on to tonight, let's talk. Um, We'd like to firstly thank uh, Auckland Transport in particular um, and also especially their walking and cycling team led by Catherine King and her fantastic group there who we've partnered with tonight to bring you tonight's conversation. Um, I also want to thank Boffa Miskell as well who are our sponsors for tonight's Auckland Conversation. Um, also our grateful thanks to the, um, our Auckland partner South Base, um, South Base Construction. Um, our design partners, Resine, and all our program supporters. Um, so look, the, the, the theme of tonight, or the outline, or the order of events this evening, is um, what we'll do is we'll, that we'll have a, a keynote speech from Lucy, our, our, our guest, um, followed by a 20-minute panelist conversation, which was an idea we thought we'd bring to the conversation to get the, the juices flowing and to get the discussion going. So I'll be joined on stage um, by some panelists, and I'll introduce to you those people in, in a few minutes. Um, and we'll also be coming up for questions to the floor, uh, a way to engage the team uh, who've turned up tonight. Um, we've got a range of ways to do that. There's the traditional, put your hand up and we'll find you with a microphone. But what the team have come up with is a, a really cool new sort of system called Slido. And um, Slido is an interactive Q&A tool for audience participation. Uh, if you've got a smartphone, we encourage you to visit um, slido.com. So that's slido.com. Um, enter the event code, which is hashtag healthy. So hashtag healthy. 
and you can ask your question. And those questions will get put onto a, a slideshow, which I can see on a, um, an iPad, which I'll be given as part of the panel discussion. Um, submit your questions, and we'll do our best to get through as many of those questions to you and, and get the, the conversation going. So um, that's fantastic. So that's uh, really how we're going to run that. Um, also, please keep tweeting and keep um, using the hashtag, the hashtag AKL Conversations. And, um, Lastly, it's really important, um, we've got a universal design conference coming up um, in September, um, but we always try to ensure that the Auckland Conversations events are inclusive and accessible. Um, so on-demand viewing of the event is happening now, live streaming around the world. Um, I know a lot of people from all over the world, UK, um, Canada, uh, US and France, who phone me to say they're going to tune in uh, with a glass of wine somewhere in the world listening in. So uh, kia ora to everybody from around the world. But it's a really great way to keep that conversation going. And for those of you in Auckland who couldn't be here tonight, um, welcome to. Um, but that full transcript of the presentation this evening will be, um, and as well as captioning of the event, will be available on the Auckland Conversations website um, in the next few days. So that's really how we're going to run the program. So look, very quickly, let's get to the main course for tonight. But um, just tonight's conversation about healthy streets. I mean, it's um, like many global cities, Auckland is, is, is not dissimilar. Um, we're facing significant health challenges. Uh, the rates of obesity are climbing. Diabetes is growing. Um, the number of children walking to school and cycling to school is declining dramatically. You know, we're all suffering from poor mental health. And so there's a really big imp implication and impact and connection between all these things. It's a system. It's a system of things. Um, oddly enough, I wanted to be a doctor when I was uh, 18. And um, I don't know, maybe I just wasn't intelligent enough or, or whatever it was, but I ended up becoming an urban planner. And you know what? Oddly enough, 25 years later, I think that the link between urban planning and, and being a doctor, um, I couldn't do that. But, but my team and I, we feel like we're sort of almost GPs of the city. And I think that link between public health and urban planning and cities could not be more relevant. So tonight's conversation is, is really apt and really important. So. Before we introduce our, our speaker tonight, I'd like to introduce uh, um, Lisa Mean. Lisa is, um, uh, run, works, is a principal um, planner, urban designer um, at uh, Boffa Miskel, and Boffa are our official uh, sponsors for this evening. Um, she's going to give us an official welcome for Lucy. Um, Lisa's worked as an urban designer and urban planner um, in New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and also the Republic of Ireland since 1994. Her experience spans a range of areas, including a particular emphasis on designing and facilitating innovative consultation and community participation processes. Um, she also has worked on large-scale master planning, town centre regeneration strategies, urban design, design guidance, as well as conservation and heritage planning. Uh, Lisa's a great friend of ours, our team, and it's a privilege to have her here tonight. So Lisa, please come to the stage and please give her a warm round of applause. Tēnā koutou. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Boffa Muskell as the major sponsor of tonight's Auckland Conversation. Wow, this really echoes. It's quite weird. <laughs> Healthy streets for Auckland. As both an urban designer and a mother, the relationship between the public realm and urban form is of keen interest to me. When I returned to Auckland in 2004, after several years living and working as an urban designer and urban regeneration specialist in the Northern Hemisphere, urban design was becoming increasingly socialised within the built environment professions. The Auckland City Urban Design Panel had recently been established and the Ministry for the Environment published its first urban design protocol, setting a national framework for quality urban design. Fast forward to 2018, Auckland is growing up. We're still learning from overseas, but we are developing our own urban design vernacular, reflecting our place here in the South Pacific. There is a greater acceptance of the value of high quality public realm design in urban areas, as witnessed by the throngs of people enjoying the waterfront, Britomart and the shared spaces and open places throughout Auckland city centre. We have bought into the vision of Auckland becoming the world's most livable city. And as built environment professionals, we want to make that happen and we apply that vision to the work that we do. 
As design practitioners, we know that good urban design can help to make places safer and more secure and can motivate people to undertake physical exercise, in turn creating health benefits. This is common sense to most of us in this room. However, recent research investigating the economic value of walking in Auckland city centre, which included Boffema School's case studies applying Transport for London's Valuing the Urban Realm toolkit, demonstrated that transport projects that deliver public realm and walkability benefits have lost out to projects that don't do so because of the way in which transport projects have traditionally been evaluated here in New Zealand. Given the historic emphasis on providing for motorised transport, it's not surprising, as Ludo was saying, that the rate of obesity is increasing and the number of children walking and cycling to school has been declining for several years, disproportionately so in lower socioeconomic areas. We're now at a critical tipping point. Both local and central government have strong directives to increase active transport. Recent projects that Boffermisco has been fortunate to be involved in for Auckland Council and Auckland Transport, such as Te Aramua Future Streets in Mangere, the Waterview Shared Path and Waitamata Safe Routes are confirming what most designers already suspected, that making streets and neighbourhoods safer and more appealing for people to walk and cycle leads to increased active transport and consequently improvements in health. Te Aramua Future Streets in particular is a great example of collaborative working between public health and built environment professionals and is well aligned with the work Lucy Saunders has been doing. Such projects showcase the benefits of improving the quality of the built environment, strengthening connections and improving safety in areas where the greatest impact can be felt. We must design our cities and towns for all people and when I say cities, I don't just mean the popular inner city destinations, but our suburbs too. Those places that tourists don't go, places for real people. We must design healthy streets that encourage people to walk and cycle. Collectively, we have a responsibility to create places that are safe, attractive, vibrant and conducive to health and well-being for present and future generations. To this end, we're very privileged to host Lucy Saunders, who developed the Healthy Streets approach and the 10 Healthy Streets indicators, and has valuable lessons to share that we can all adopt into our design practices. Thank you. That's perfect, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you to you and your team again, to, to Boffers. Um, right, so look, I've now got the great pleasure of introducing you all to Lucy. She's been um, travelling the country, I know, and is here now in Auckland this evening to give her keynote. Um, I'd like to just do a few little bits about your background, Lucy, if that's all right, before we, we call you up here. But um, Lucy is a consultant in public health, um, specialising in transport, public realm and planning. Um, she developed a healthy streets approach, which you've just heard from Lisa um, about, um, and that's the 10 healthy streets indicators in 2011. In 2015, she was awarded the Transport Planner of the Year by um, the Transport Planning Society, and her work won awards from the International UITP and UK Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation. Lucy currently leads on the integration of transport and public health in London, supporting TFL, Transport for London, the boroughs and, the, and various advocacy organisations. Lucy works across both the GLA, the Greater London Authority, and also Transport for London, embedding the healthy streets approach in policy and practice. Um, in 2014, TFL became the first transport authority in the world to publish a health action plan, which Lucy wrote and led its three-year implementation. Um, Lucy, I had a few phone calls from old friends at uh, London Borough of Tower Hamlets who said they apply your Healthy Streets Indicator Programme to every single transport project in uh, London Borough of Tower Hamlets. So um, it's, it's happening. Lucy's worked as a public health specialist across a wide range of organisations from local to international level, including the NHS, government, academic, private and voluntary sectors. She advises the World Health Organisation, the WHO, and the UK government departments for transport and health, and the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, called NICE. She gained fellowship of the UK Faculty of Public Health in 2012 on completion of the UK Specialist Medical Training Programme in Public Health. She has a master's degree in geography and public health. Lucy, it's, we, should, we need you in Auckland. It would be great to have you here. But you're here tonight to address us all, and I'm really privileged to meet you and uh, have, 
and hear about your work. So everybody, give her a please a rapturous Auckland <laughs> welcome. Good evening. Right, healthy streets. It starts off gloomy, but it picks up, so bear with me. We'll start off with the five big health impacts of transport in urban in environments. Um, and I need a little bit of participation from you for this bit in a very low-tech way. So I hope you'll take my word for it that these are the five big health impacts of um, our urban realm of transport. And they all relate to how we manage motorised road transport. So severance, that's the effect of people not being able to get from where they are to where they want to be. Uh, it can be caused by very busy roads with fast moving traffic or a lot of parked vehicles. It can also be caused by rivers and railway lines. Um, it impacts on our health by um, isolating people and um, causing them to not be able to access the services and the people they need to interact with. And there's noise, air quality, road traffic injuries and physical activity. So I'd like you through a show of hands in a moment to vote for the one that you think of these five is the biggest one in Auckland. So out of these five health impacts of the transport system, in Auckland, which one do you think has the biggest impact on health in the round? So we'll start at the end and we'll work this way. So first of all, can I have a show of hands of those who think that severance is the biggest health impact in Auckland? Okay. Noise. Air quality. Road traffic injuries, physical activity. Ooh, let's see if you're right. So this is probably the most miserable graph you'll get to see. It's all grey, and it is, cheerfully, the top causes of illness and early death amongst New Zealanders. I told you it will pick up. Um, at the top is overweight and obesity. And um, for those of you who voted physical activity, it's there at number 10. And out of the main health impacts of the transport system and urban realm, um, physical activity is the biggest one. So you can give yourselves a pat on the back, those of you who voted for low physical activity. So to be number 10 out of all the causes of illness and early death that we can do something about in Auckland, that's quite a significant influence of our transport system but it's actually even bigger than this. Because all these bars that are highlighted in green, they all relate to physical activity. So if you are um, physically active, you reduce your risk of overweight and obesity, of high blood pressure, of type two diabetes, occupational risks, high cholesterol and kidney disease. So it's much bigger than you might even have thought. Then air pollution, for those of you who put your hands up for air quality, it is there at number 13. Um, there are obviously other causes of uh, air pollution aside from uh, road transport, but it's, it has a big impact and it causes a 1,000 premature deaths a year in New Zealand. Um, so um, vehicles, even electric vehicles, contribute to air pollution through tyre and brake wear, causing particulates to enter the atmosphere. And then road traffic injuries, they don't get their own special bar from the way that the data is sliced up, but they do feature in this uh, top causes in number five. So these are the road traffic injuries that result from someone who's intoxicated, killing or injuring themselves or somebody else. And further down the graph, there'll be other road traffic injuries that are not related to people being intoxicated. So when we look at these all together, I hope you can understand why I chose, as a public health professional, to go and work in the transport sector. Because if I can do anything that's going to improve people's health, probably the best use of my efforts is to change the way that we use our public realm and our streets. Because look, out of all these top causes of illness and early death, a lot of them relate to how we use our street environments. So. How popular do you think I was when I went up to my transport planning colleagues who already had a difficult job? It's not easy planning transport and managing complex environments like streets. So how popular do you think I was when I said, in addition to your already difficult job, 
I've got five other things I'd like you to be worrying about together at the same time. Um, I didn't ask them to worry about five other things. I asked them to think of 10 other things in every decision that they made. And these are the 10 healthy streets indicators. So I'm gonna just go through each of these now. The first one is easy to cross. And this refers back to that severance issue that I mentioned earlier on. And this is a little example from Valencia in Spain, but there's actually a much more local one just on the, on the street down here. It's a street that is designed so that it's very clear to the people passing through in a vehicle that the people who are prioritized in this location are those who are crossing the street on foot. The next indicator is shade and shelter. And I think you probably have a much better awareness of the importance of this for health than many other audiences around the world. But shade from sun um, to protect people uh, from skin cancer and shelter from rain, and um, I understand it sometimes rains here, is that right? Um, means that um, not only that people are protected from the harms that pollution can cause them, but also that streets are welcoming environments for people to be out, spending time, walking, cycling, <coughs> Uh, socialising, whatever the weather. And this is an example from Chicago, and it shows maybe one of the most important things about healthy streets, which is it's not something that falls within the domain of one professional group. So this street here, the architects have put design features on buildings that provide shelter, and the businesses have put awnings out that provide further shelter, and then the local authorities probably been involved in planting those street trees, and businesses have put some other greening out as well. So it's definitely a collective effort to make that a street in which people feel they can go out whatever the weather and enjoy being there. The next one is places to stop and rest. And we all need these, um, particularly at certain points in our lives, when we're very young, uh, when we're much older, when we're injured, when we're carrying heavy bags. Um, we all need them, but also, in addition to that need, they help to make streets social places, and we need social interaction for our own mental health and well-being. So providing places for people to stop and, and rest, change the way that streets feel so that people stop and interact and take a break from the hustle and bustle of life. And this example here is from Montreal in Canada. And in this particular example, some on-street parking was removed to widen the footway and provide some on-street parking. And it was really welcomed by the local businesses because it meant that people spent more time there and then spent more money in their shops. Not too noisy. So the health impacts of noise are really under-recognized but incredibly important. Uh, we know that noise during childhood affects uh, child development and children's ability to perform well at school. Throughout life, it affects our ability to sleep well, and as adults, it can affect blood pressure and our ability to do well at work. And this is an example from New York where some of the carriageway space was taken away from the through flow of traffic um, to provide a space for people to walk and cycle and spend time. And just the removal of traffic from that part of the street made it was much quieter and meant that these people here in this picture can have a conversation without having to shout. The next indicator is people choose to walk and cycle. Now there's an obvious link here with physical activity, which we can see is really important for our health. But the key word is choose, because in every community there are some people who are walking and cycling at the moment, not out of choice. And that's not an outcome that is desirable. What we want to provide is an environment in which everybody feels that it's an attractive choice for them for those short journeys. And this is an example from Vancouver, where a lane of uh, traffic was um, converted into a two-way cycle track with a nice green buffer, so it feels like a really pleasant place to ride along the street. People feel safe. This refers not only to safety from road traffic injuries, but also personal safety from street crime and antisocial behaviour. And this is a street in Vienna, in Austria, and I think this picture is quite interesting because the people who are walking around in this shopping street seem completely unfazed by the bus that's travelling down that street. There's a huge amount of trust going on in this picture, which is a result of a really well-designed street, but also um, some probably really well-trained bus drivers as well. 
things to see and do. These are so important. Um, we know that if people have the things that they need to use regularly within a short distance of where they are, then they've got the option of being able to walk or cycle and therefore build some physical activity into their daily routine. But we also know that if streets are visually engaging at eye level, people are much more willing to walk and cycle and spend time on those streets. So it's a real win-win. Uh, and this example is from Paris in France. And uh, this is a pretty drab and uninteresting street. Um, but I spotted these slightly unusual collections of pot plants on the street and it piqued my curiosity and we should never underestimate um, the power of curiosity to get people to do things they wouldn't normally do. So um, these little plants resulted in me walking down a street I had absolutely no reason to walk down because I was curious to see what was going on. People feel relaxed. If we want people to uh, walk and cycle, it needs to feel so pleasant and enjoyable to do that it's preferable for short journeys to, to driving a car. And that means making sure that our footways are wide and smooth so that people can walk and talk and that our cycle tracks feel safe and wide and smooth so people can cycle and talk. And um, we really need to think about our streets as social spaces when we're travelling. When we're in a car, we can socialise with the other people who are in the car, and we should have that same privilege when we're walking and cycling as well. And this is a street from London, um, which has been designed definitely with the view of making the people on it feel really relaxed and these two women are walking along having a conversation and not having to think about uh, obstacles or hazards in their way. Clean air, the health impacts of this are quite well known. They impact um, uh, our pulmonary and our cardiovascular system. And um, this example here is from Seoul in South Korea. And this lush green um, riverside walkway was a multi-lane highway and the air quality in this area was very, very poor. They replaced the multi-lane highway with this uh, extended uh, route through the middle of the city that means people can walk very, very long distances away from traffic with much better quality um, air in their local area. And everyone feels welcome. This is maybe the ultimate goal of healthy streets, that our streets are inclusive places for everyone in the community to feel like it's their street. The space between our buildings belongs to all of us and we should feel that collective um, comfort and welcoming feeling when we're in the street. And this last example is from Freiburg in Germany. And um, in New Zealand, teenagers are amongst the uh, least active of our population. Only about 10% of secondary school um, students are achieving the minimum level of physical activity they need for their health. So I picked this picture because it shows two young women who are cycling, one cycling, one roller skating, um, back from school. And um, I think when we see our streets filled with young people, it's a sign that we're really heading in the right direction. So the 10 healthy streets indicators, um, they're not 10 separate things. They're all connected to how we feel on the street, so they're all interconnected with each other. If we make our streets easier to cross, then people feel safer. And if people feel safer, then they're more likely to choose to walk or cycle. And if they're choosing to do that rather than go in the car, then the air quality is improved, which makes the street a much more relaxing place and a much more relaxing street is one that is easier to cross. So you can see it's all self-reinforcing. Another way of looking at it is to take a street. And here I've just got a, a local parade of shops that could be in any residential area. And the first thing that you might do would be to widen the footways because this has two um, roles. First of all, it makes it much more relaxing and sociable for people who are walking. But by narrowing down the carriageway, it also means that the people who are driving through that street will go a little bit more slowly, which would be appropriate in a place where there are shops and footways. And there's a crossing, and the crossing is actually at the point where people want to cross the street. It's radical stuff, this. So um, this is at the entrance of a uh, public transport um, station. And there's a, a, a lower speed limit so that people understand this is a people place. So we go a bit more slowly. We can provide shade and shelter through um, planting and through um, colonnades and awnings. Places to stop and rest in the form of maybe the traditional on-street bench, but it might be a parklet or it might be a pocket park. Making the street feel much safer by making sure the street lighting is designed to 
um, like the footway and the cycle track, not just the carriageway for the cars, and designing our buildings so that they look out over the street and provide some natural surveillance. And making it a more attractive environment to walk and cycle by providing public transport services that people can walk to, and maybe this street might need a, a cycle track as well. Cycle parking, bike hire, there are other things that can help. Things to see and do, making sure that street is really visually engaging at eye level, and it might be about some temporary changes it, uh, to pique people's curiosity, and it might be about the design of the buildings, and it might be about the things that people put in their shop windows. There's many different ways to deliver the things to see and do indicator. And then finally, for those vehicles that do need to remain on a street that's got people on it, um, trying to make sure that they are um, electric wherever possible to minimise the harms of air pollution. So healthy streets is about giving streets back to people. And a street that works for people is a street that's good for health. So these are my 10 healthy streets indicators. Uh, how popular do you think I was when I said I think we should be doing this much more complicated way of doing what we've always been doing. I think we should start from scratch and focus everything we do around what it feels like for people on streets. Well, there's a lot of people who have an influence over our streets and public realm who don't really care a lot about health, and that is absolutely fine, because healthy streets isn't just about human health. It delivers on so many other fronts that the reason why healthy streets is something that a lot of people can get on board with is because it tackles a whole range of other issues that many of us are dealing with. So some of the key ones um, that cities around the world are, are looking at at the moment is how do we improve quality of life of the people who live in this city? How do we tackle congestion? How do we deal with the rising cost of living and our failing high streets? And what about the rising public service costs? And the reason why the healthy streets approach is appealing to them is because it helps them to deal with the challenge that they're facing at the same time. So I thought I'd leave you just with one example. This is an important example because this is a street that uh, is in London. It's in East London. Most people who live in London have never heard of this street. And most people who live in London will never visit this street. In fact, most of the people who live in that borough don't know about that street and have not visited that street. This is not about a big city centre, um, high cost project, high profile project. This is just an ordinary local parade of shops in a residential area. And this is what it looked like until recently. And this is what it looks like now. Actually, it looks a little bit greener than that because it's summer in London. Um, but even in winter, it still had children out playing on it. And um, this is what the street looks like before and after, so you get a sense of, of what it's about. It's it's about taking some of those vehicles out of the street space and letting people go in and seeing what they do with it. Healthy Streets is about giving streets back to people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. That was, that was perfect. A great way to sort of start the session. I, I particularly love the photograph of the, uh, that sort of bus plaza where the two people walking sort of completely obliviously with this, this, this huge, and I think it's to do with culture as well, a, a deep-seated culture of understanding that, that transit's part of the city and uh, that it's part of, of everyday life. So, look, that was, that was perfect. Sets the scene um, ideally. So, look, what I'm going to do now is we're going to give Lucy a bit of a break um, to have a glass of water or wine or whatever you want. Um, and I'm going to introduce the panellists. They're going to come up um, one at a time. As, I, as they come up, I'm going to introduce and talk a little bit about them. So, um, first up is Shane. So, Shane Ellison. Shane is our chief executive, the new chief executive at Adwalkton Transport. Um, Shane has been the CEO. Are you getting a clap? <laughs> Shane's been the CEO um, since December, and um, we're, we're all working, a lot of us are working very closely with Shane and his team. Um, he's arrived at a really important moment in, in, in our genesis as a city. Um, so he's a really key player, and so it's great to have you here tonight, Shane. Thank you. Um, he um, has over 20, experience, 20 years' experience 
globally as a, a senior leadership roles in transport and infrastructure sectors. Um, most recently, Shane was um, an international development officer and chief operating officer um, for the New South Wales and, and Queensland for Transdev. Um, they're the world's largest private operator of public transport. Um, really importantly also, Shane has worked all, all around the world, particularly in Europe and also in, um, in North America. So um, it's great to have him as our new CEO and uh, it's good to have him here tonight. Um, next up tonight is um, Michael Hale. Michael's a public health um, medicine specialist at the Auckland Regional Public Health Service. So Michael, do you want to um, join us up on the stage? Dr. Hale is a uh, public health medicine specialist at the a Auckland Regional Public Health Service, where he is the clinical lead for nutrition, physical activity, promotion, healthy urban form, and um, a word I'd never known before, but it's per tersis. Is that right? The right pronounced? Hooping cough. Which is hooping cough, which I, I didn't know. So per, per tersis, per tussis. Um, he's part of the Healthy Auckland um, Together Coalition, which is changing our city so it is easy for our people to eat well and to be active. Uh, so these, these, these themes are, are powerful and, and linked. Michael has over 14 years experience in the public health sector, including roles in the Heart Foundation, uh, the National Screening Unit, and, um, and uh, yeah, sorry, um, Public Health Service and um, Apologies for that. Um, so yeah, that, thank you, thank you, Mike. <laughs> I don't know where the rest of your introduction is. I apologise. <laughs> That's good. Oh, here we go. Sorry. I think it's important that we get we get the full picture. So you've got 14 years' experience in the public health sector, including roles in the Heart Foundation, the National Screening Unit, um, and the Health Quality and Safety Commission. Uh, Michael is interested in how urban and transport planning can improve well-being in our neighbourhoods and how we can reduce the promotion and availability of unhealthy food in favour of nutritious food. So thank you for coming tonight. And uh, last but not least is um, a gentleman who many of you know, um, Councillor Richard Hills. Richard, do you want to come and join us on stage? <laughs> Richard, um, oh, well, my team say we're lucky to have him. Um, he's a, a passionate um, promoter and champion for um, alternative modes of transport, including sky path, uh, rail to the North Shore. Um, he's a, a very vocal and strong advocate um, of public and active transport, um, has a huge interest in, in mental health and well-being, and, and our team uh, have talked to, us, to you a lot about that, Richard. Um, he's also the deputy chair of the um, planning committee, um, Councillor Darby is the chair who's here tonight, and which has responsibility for Auckland's to transport, infrastructure, spatial planning, water and regeneration. So um, you're a great ally to have um, for the city and we're, we're, we're proud to have you on board. So thank you for coming tonight. So look, there's your panellists tonight who are joining Lucy. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a 20 minutes chat and um, we're going to see how that goes. So what I thought um, we'd do first is we've heard about them uh, and their roles, but what I'd like to do now is, is to be a bit pointed and ask about what you think and how you think, um, and that will give us a sense of who you are and, and, and how it's all working. So I'm going to direct the first question to Shane. Um, so look, Shane, uh, Lucy's shown us um, in her presentation about that link between streets, urban design, um, and how that, and favouring walking and cycling and public transport are, are absolutely critical, fundamental to public health. What do you think of, of that? Um, firstly, and secondly, what is Auckland Transport doing uh, to ensure that our roads and streets are better designed for, uh, for active travel? Shane. Is that working? Yeah? yeah. Can everyone hear? Everyone? Let's, let's do a quick sound check. Is, do you want to say hello, hello? Hello. <laughs> okay, Kira great. Kata. Perfect. Lucy, can you wave your wand and just make it all happen now for <laughs> us, please? Um, it make my job a lot easier. Um, look, it's uh, it's hard to argue with that. Um, yeah. For it's uh, we have a we have a very tragic situation in Auckland at the moment uh, in our region um, with the number of deaths and serious injuries on our roads having escalated by seventy percent between two thousand and fourteen and two thousand and seventeen. Uh, Lucy touched on the number of uh, teenagers that are that are not active, um, sadly, and many of you in the room will have uh, secondary school-aged children or children approaching secondary school 
uh, that situation is far worse. Um, the number of, uh, and Catherine might correct me, but the number of secondary school aged children that were killed or seriously injured on our roads in 2014 was around 56. In 2017, that number had grown to over 100. Um, so, um, if they're not feeling safe on our streets, um, how are they going to be active? So, um, yep. yes, we've got we've got a lot of work to do. Um, yep. But thankfully, 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 um, we have a council and central government and a board of Auckland Transport that we have where where they are 100 percent aligned. Okay. Um, we have a once in a generation opportunity to make a make transformational change in Auckland uh, with the funding that's been achieved through ATAP uh, and which is uh, targeted at almost all parts of the model that Lucy's presented. So uh, we, are, we are committed to delivering on that. It won't be easy. Yeah. Let's not kid ourselves. It, it won't be easy. I'd like to have the wand. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, we're 100% we're committed to, to that. And, and you, Shane, I mean, you're, you're, you're here new. Are you, what's, you're, you're here for a, a good time because it's important that we hold, <laughs> we hold this agenda for a, a period of time and not just in and out. And so what's your commitment to, to Auckland? <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's important we recognise that um, I left here in 2004 and I, I've told this, uh, many people have heard me say this, I, I've been away for 14 years. Um, I've come back and it's very easy when you live in the city day to day to not see the difference and a number of people in the city need to take a lot of credit for what has been achieved in the last 14 years and um, for those of you who don't know, um, 2017 we celebrated the first year where more people came into the city by public transport than yeah. by private vehicle. That is, that is a huge achievement and it's been done on the back of a political commitment and, uh, and it, it shows the way for the future. Um, my commitment, I'd love to see the urban, urban cycleway network completed. Yep. The continuation of the investment uh, for the, in the program business case for walking and cycling, That's all the investment in public transport, uh, all the transformational change that that brings in terms of public realm yep. um, and you know the flow on benefits that all that enables um, you know we have the third third biggest population uh, third most obese population in the OECD I mean it's we've got to do something about it Okay, well that, that's a great, a great start. Thank you very much. That's a, a great way to introduce Shane to all of you and um, to get that, the, the conversation going. Um, next up, we're going to just have a quick question to you, Michael. It's along similar lines a little bit, but you know, health starts with our streets. We've just heard that. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, I guess the active travel program, the investment in walking and cycling, public transport, better planning. What is, what is your district health board and what is your your team doing how are, how are you part of this conversation how are you part of the solutions because obviously this is all inextricably linked so could you just give us a sense of what you thought about Lucy what she was saying not about Lucy but the the, 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 the story that's been told here and what are you guys doing to be part of that solution uh, sure uh, back in 2014 the health boards of Auckland came to our organization um, recognising the big impact that uh, the rising amount of childhood obesity was causing and asked us to take some leadership in coordinating a program. Yep. Um, what, what we've got out of that is the Healthy Auckland Together uh, group, which has got a little um, stand over there that you're welcome to check out some of the activities. You know, often these things have been the health sector um, getting together and it's been really important with our health partners to do that. But in this, um, in this time as well, we recognise that uh, we're good at, at treating disease, but uh, most of the uh, causes and most of the levers for this issue lie well outside of the health system. And so if we want to make action on physical activity, action on nutrition, action on obesity, then we need to be talking to the people who are in charge of the built environment. So Auckland Council and Auckland Transport are key partners uh, in Healthy Auckland together. So there's an yeah. alliance, a coalition, 
uh, dedicated to addressing this issue at a citywide level. Uh, so that's been been really key to have that platform. Through that platform, we've been, um, you know, th these different sectors of health and local government have got together around the program business case for cycling, uh, currently around the, the strategy for um, safety as well. We've also recognised uh, something else in the public realm, um, walk, uh, water infrastructure is really lacking in Auckland. Yep. Uh, it touches on the design office, but you know, if we were to compare Melbourne or Brisbane or other cities, um, we're at a third to a half of the level of water infrastructure, it's, and we don't even know where it all is. Um, and that's an important part if we want people to be active, if we want people to have healthy choices in those realms. And so we've got together around a project called Why Auckland to start uh, improving both infrastructure and the public promotion of water as a healthy choice, deliberately um, aiming to displace sugary sweetened beverages as a choice there. So there's a number of tangible actions yep. um, in reference to the, the healthy streets approach, just a complete endorsement that you know a healthy street is a livable street. I think there's wins for health, wins for good design, wins for people. So yeah, really excited about that. Thank you. I mean, I guess, Lucy, it's interesting coming from the UK originally, um, in the councils in New Zealand, in the UK, we would control health, education, there's police services, and that's what the CEOs did um, within the local authorities even. Here, that is all in central government, that is all funded through that. So I guess that coalition is, is trying to solve that issue. But I think, uh, do you think there needs to be more done? Uh, to drive that through because it's about the delivery on the ground and the, the two things often don't link, um, you know, whereas we put schools, it's really interesting to see that has been quite a separate conversation to planning uh, when it's actually intricate to that. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's a lot of benefits to having them all housed in one. You know, we can see it, an example of a successful city addressing some of these issues like New York where you've yeah. got a uh, transport commissioner and you've got a public health commissioner looking at things like size of uh, soft drinks and, and uh, yeah. that type of thing as well. And in, in New Zealand, we are in our silos. And so that's um, particularly why we've you know, taken this Healthy Auckland Together approach to bring everyone together to make sure that, um, yeah, that the built environment is really supporting the um, people making healthy choices. Okay, well, that's, that's really interesting. I, you know, we, we often compete with Australia a lot in what we talk about, and I think we have more fast food outlets, uh, drive-ins per, per capita than, than Australia, which is a, not a great achievement. And I think if you design places to, to be easy to do certain activities, people will do that. And the human beings are, I say often lazy, but maybe it's they're efficient. They'll look for the easiest way to do something. And if you make the city easy to behave in a certain way, they will. So those, all those pieces need to link together. So, um, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. It's a, it's a systems issue, and you know, if you're seeing uh, every part of the population putting on weight or struggling to meet physical activity guidelines or eat well, this is not an issue of uh, individual behavioural choice. It's not a collective failure of goodwill. This is us responding to a system that is pushing us in this direction. Uh, yeah. And a system is really good at, at producing a very consistent outcome, and we've got a very consistent outcome, and so we need to address the system to change that. Fantastic. That, that's great. Well, that was a theme that Lucy talked about, the, the systems thinking, which is critical. Um, so look, um, Richard, um, an interesting question. If you were mayor um, in 10 years' time, I'll say, um, what, do you, what would you do? And how, how, and how would you ensure this is embedded into the thinking that we're applying for the city? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, um, just want to thank everyone for all the, we're just the politicians, many of you are doing the mahi on the ground in this work or doing the campaigning and the activism and all the advocacy that gets us to um, make the decisions we made for the 10 year budget and will force us all to make um, better decisions and, and work even harder. So I just wanna put that out there. And if the hypothetical situation um, <laughs> came up that I was mayor in 10 years, um, Lucy would be the CEO of Auckland Transport after Shane has left. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, That's uh, a great answer. I, I think, well, the obvious answer is that we would uh, do things based on evidence uh, with our roads and streets and our um, cities, town centres. But also, um, my personal view would to be try and get, uh, well, we would just use the evidence. But the other thing was, to get local people involved, but 
from children to older people on every street in the area. So uh, when I was on the local board, actually, I set up some children's panels, and everyone expected the young people would ask for outlandish things. All they wanted was safe walkways, safe streets, um, this particular footpath fixed up, this thing, this light fixed. It was all the things that are, that are so obvious that we miss maybe because we're looking at the overall um, picture. So you don't, uh, and I don't think the loud voices of um, anti-change can really, I mean they probably can, but they can tell kids <coughs> that they're wrong. I, I think we'd fix a whole lot more if we just ask kids, um, is your local street safe? Would you cross it? Would you walk to school if you could? Um, all those yeah. sorts of things. It's bringing young people into the decision making um, straight away. And it's also that ownership of every, so it might not be possible to do it on every street, but I'm sure you could get your local schools to do a proper focus on, on healthy streets. And then you're, if you fix it for young people and you fix it for our oldest um, people in the community, then you're probably going to fix it for everyone, I think. Yeah, and, 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 and you're a, a huge proponent of the impact of, of, of mental health issues as well. I mean, is there any sort of, how's that going in terms of the, the, your, your position around that, looking at the city and how we're doing in that space? What are the things we could do better and, and maybe perhaps give us a sense of what you'd like to achieve from that point of view? Yes, I mean, I, when I first got into, so I used to work as a youth worker before I was... Oh, right, um, okay on the council, and I worked mostly with young people in high schools around Auckland, and the biggest issue constantly was, obviously, people's mental health, youth suicide, um, you know, some of the young people I worked with, unfortunately, took their lives during that time. Um, there is a lot of negativity, sadness, um, and that has a million different factors, but I think the way our city is built, and the way we interface with nature and art and happiness and events and other people has a huge impact yeah. on, on our mental health. So if maybe we could you know, meet more people, talk more, and not just drive home, go behind our gate and never talk to our neighbours, maybe if we had more spaces to bump into each other, um, young people could run around on their own without having to be um, parents being afraid of their, of their kids running out on the streets. Um, if people were just able to spend more time in places that weren't just car parks or roads, that would be, you know, a really Correct. good outcome, I think. I, I mean, I usually bus to work. The other day I had to, I didn't have to drive, I chose to drive. But I drove, I, w I was back and forth all day. But honestly, it was the most, I think I was more frustrated and more stressed out than any other day that week. Um, it was triple the time to get here. It was the most negative experience. People... I'm, I'm a person who likes to let people in, um, which is apparently a crime. Um, so letting people, you know, and people were beeping, waving their hands, pulling their fingers because you're just trying to be friendly to other people on the road, which is easy when you're walking or um, on the bus or whatever. But I, I think our city currently, we're getting there, we're moving forward, but is currently designed for really negative interactions with fake people. Like it's that cyclist, those cyclists, those those people, you know, where it's just, you know, your friend. I kind of hate using the, oh, yeah. what if it was your mother? Or, well, it should be, what if it was just another human, I guess. Yeah. And we don't look at people like that when we're on our way to work if you're in a car. Um, that, that's good. And I think, you know, we, we, we talk a lot on Twitter as well. And um, there was that recent tweet uh, talking about Elon Musk's uh, opinions about public transport and how, you know, <laughs> sitting next to somebody who's sort of socially deprived and, you know, there's that elite projection thing going on, which is all around the world. And, you know, white middle class men um, telling everybody else how to live. And I suppose, you know, it's interesting having that discussion. And when we, um, somebody on the tweet said, you know, when I don't drive, I, I feel more connected. When I drive, I feel more lonely, and it's an interesting piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So that whole system um, thinking is key. So look, thank you um, very much. Lucy, just bring you into the discussion for a second, and then we'll try and have a debate. But, you know, how did it happen? How on earth did you end up at TfL? I you know, worked there many years ago, and I couldn't imagine them having a, a public health specialist running a program at TfL. What is it that happened? Who did you speak to? Who did you convince? Because it's... It's, it's easy to talk about theory, but what happened, if you don't mind? Yeah, sure. Um, so at, at this present moment in time, I'm the only public health specialist working in a transport authority anywhere in the world. And this is because it's not structurally set up that that is a thing that happens. So um, I was recently described, and I think it was meant as a compliment, by a, a leading academic in the UK, um, 
uh, called Ben Goldacre. He described me as a hustler. Right. Um, but I took it as a positive statement, but um, I basically hustled my way in there. So um, I went to meet with uh, Transport for London, and I said that I, I knew a fair bit about the relationship between transport and health, and I thought I had something to offer them. And they said, um, we've, we're on it, we've got it all sorted, we've even got a publication. And they showed me their publication, and it is a picture on the front cover of a woman cycling past a hospital. And the <laughs> document is mainly about how to get a bus to a hospital. Nice. And that was, that was where we were at in 2013 in London in terms of understanding the complex relationship between transport and health. So I said I thought I might have something that I could add to this conversation, and I offered a try before you buy. Um, it's available to others. Um, three months <laughs> I worked for them. Um, I was being paid by somebody else who was happy to let me go and work for them for three months and see if I could uh, add anything to what they were doing already. And then um, I started working for them part-time, and then I built it up. And now I'm actually hiring a team of people who work directly for the Transport Authority. And in my opinion, to make the kind of change that we need, you do have to take people with that public health expertise and employ them in the organisations that really have the power. Um, partnership working is hard at the best of times, but you can be so much more effective if you actually work in and with the people who you want to help to do their job differently. So um, I, yeah. I'm a strong advocate for public health leaving the public health department and going and sitting with the people that they want to influence. Fantastic. Well, so really interesting story, and it's quite. I think Auckland tends to sort of think that it's um, it's always looking elsewhere for answers, and I think Shane mentioned this earlier. You know, we've we've achieved a lot, and we need to make sure we congratulate congratulate ourselves because success breeds success and breeds confidence. And with confident staff, confident councillors, you, you make better decisions at the end of the day. Um, but it's interesting. Your program has been quite globally recognised. I mean, I've got people literally emailing from all around the world saying. We want to hear from Lucy as well. So, um, you know, how are TfL doing in terms of rolling this out within their program? If Shane was to ad adopt the, this, this this principle, you know, what what are they doing from a practical delivery point of view? How's so, it happening in reality? Yeah. So, Healthy Streets is um, one of those things that looks deceptively simple until you scratch under the surface yeah. and realise that actually, to deliver those ten indicators, you not only need to completely turn the way the Transport Authority works on its head but you also need to get a whole load of other stakeholders uh, working alongside. So in London, the mayor has embedded the healthy streets approach in all of his statutory strategies. So it's okay. not just in the transport strategy, it's in the policing and crime plan, it's in the spatial plan, which is called the London plan, it's in the environment strategy, in the health strategy, etc. And that means that all the different parts of the system have to work together, delivering these 10 healthy streets indicators. But Obviously, Transport for London have got a very, very big role in this. And so what has happened is quite a fundamental change in the governance of the organisation and the way that money is allocated and projects are prioritised based on how they're delivering the Healthy Streets approach. Because Healthy Streets is about saying we don't just have a selection of different modes of transport and whichever mode of transport shouts the loudest gets the most money. It's about saying our streets are a finite space between yeah. the buildings and how can we get those environments to work best for people by balancing all those different modes at the same time, which is a much, much more difficult job. Yeah, and that linking that back to budgets as well and thinking about that there'll be a, a natural view that to add these things and to consider these things is going to be a cost, yeah. but I, I perhaps... You can't afford not to think about this stuff. So that's probably the best way to... Well, what I always say is we're spending money every single day on our streets anyway, and it's not about spending more money, it's about yeah. spending the money differently. Great. Look, does anyone want to respond to any of that? I'd like to open up to some questions from the floor. Um, does anybody want to ask anything to, of each other, or, 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 or um, we can open to the questions? Uh, yeah, I Richard? On um, Lucy's point about the money, I, I thought one of the funniest... Um, not funny, but the situation around Skypath, uh, you know, many years ago, the discussion was the cost, the cost, the cost, and I could name three road widening projects that were three times um, the price of Skypath, and at that point, Skypath wasn't going to be um, tax or ratepayer funded at all, but yet there was still this terrible kind of um, 
discussion around something that was going to be for walking and cycling that might cost some money, but then you'd never ever have the same level of discussion over something like a road widening project, which is kind of 40 million, 50 million, go ahead, um, do that. And I think, like Lucy said, we're spending the money anyway. How can we retrofit our streets on every single project, even if maybe at this time we can't do the whole thing, but how about we at least start? Because sometimes there's you know, massive missed opportunities when we do re renewal projects or, or um, re rehabilitations of roads where we're not putting back better infrastructure, we're kind of just replacing it um, and spending all that money anyway. So I think it, you know, there's a good place to start. Okay, thank you very much. So look, what I'm gonna do is just break um, it into the discussion. I've, I've got a whole lot of questions, and there'll be some for Shane, some for Richard and others. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick a few and we'll just get going and see, see what happens. So look, the first question, or one of the things that's popped up, these are the ones that are most popular. People vote and they put lots of likes. First one is, uh, what's the biggest challenge Auckland is facing in Im implementation of active, of a more active travel? Maybe, maybe that's to you, Shane. So what's the biggest challenge Auckland is facing in the implementation of more active travel? Um, very good question. Um, I would, my answer right now goes back to the safety, the road safety piece. Okay. Um, until we provide safe in infrastructure, reduce speed, um, we're going to have, you know, our vulnerable road users, which are our pedestrians and cyclists, are going to be at risk. Yeah. Uh, and we need to we need to address that. Um, I'm pleased to say that, you know, we had we've got a speed management plan that was approved by the Auckland Transport Board. We're 700 kilometres of Auckland roads are going to be subject to speed management plans over the next couple of years, uh, and we need to crack on and implement that. That's good, and I think you know, that, that, that we've talked about this a lot, the idea of a sort of 30 kilometer an hour city, um, you know, get these speeds right down. It's the biggest killer, isn't it, the speed? And, and it, um, you know, even outside of schools, we still allow uh, people to drive past. In the US, they stop, people will have to stop, and they're driving their cars. So. Um, are, we work, are we working with NZCA on that? I guess you're talking to Fergus and the team, aren't you? Every yeah, day. we are. We, yeah. we need to, you know, it's a, it's a partnership approach. There's yeah. a number of players in this space. Yeah. Um, and we need to, and we're working with central government because um, the, the legislative framework makes it challenging at the moment, but we want to crack on, get it done. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, so, Lucy, um, from what you've seen of Auckland so far, I mean, it was a difficult one, this one, but it, it's popped up as highly supportive. I mean, what have you seen so far? Um, any ideas around sort of ta practical tips for getting on with this? Um, what some things that you've spotted in your travels in the last... So I haven't done a lot of travelling around Auckland and I think there's nothing worse than someone who's spent about 20 minutes in your city coming in and telling you what they think of it. Um, but, but, you have a, <laughs> but, but, but a lot of people come in quickly and we'll have a, a little, a quick view of our place and you'll take away a view of us very quickly and that view needs to be... I've had a, a very biased view. I've had a very nice bike ride around your right. cycle infrastructure okay. on an electric bike. So that Great. was amazing. Um, I also had quite an amusing experience um, coming from the airport on very early on Sunday morning in a taxi and I very rarely go in taxis. And I'd forgotten that when you get in a taxi and they ask you what you do for a job, you need to be a bit more cagey than say that you work on something to do with sustainable travel. I was fairly opaque, <laughs> but the taxi driver immediately pointed out as we drove along a very wide, um, for me, coming from London, where streets are mostly two lanes in each direction maximum. Um, we were driving along a very big, busy road, and uh, he pointed out the empty cycle track. And he said, um, look there's a cycle track here and there's no one on this cycle track. <laughs> and I was thinking, but we're on a six or eight lane highway and there's no one on that either. It's more a fact of it being very early in the morning than anything <laughs> else. <laughs> but you do get a view of um, different people's perspectives if you go out and talk to different people and it is good to hear everyone's different, different perspectives. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Um, this is a really interesting one, and I'm, I'm not. So, young women, Maori and Pacifica, and our disabled people are not as active as the rest of us. So, what's the best way to target activity intersectionally? 
Who wants to answer that one? Let me start on that, because I think uh, you know, it's clear from the active New Zealand studies that walking is um, for both women and men the number one source of our um, activity, uh, and more so as we age. So the further we age, the greater percentage of our activity will be done by walking. We stop doing other sports. Okay. Uh, and interestingly, as you age at each end of the spectrum, you become more of a vulnerable user. And uh, they are the ones who really need looking after in terms of making sure we've got a safe system. So I think if we want to do a quick um, uh, population-wide approach where we're targeting as many people in the middle of the curve, then looking at ways of making people feel safe, uh, making people think that walking is convenient and accessible and attractive, I think those type of things, which sit really well with things that we have to do every day, like commuting, uh, yeah. that would be uh, a really smart way of addressing um, for all of those communities uh, increasing physical activity. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, Richard, do you want to um, comment? Um, well, I think that probably the solution is to try and ensure young Māori women and women and people with disabilities are in leadership roles making yeah. decisions around transport um, because there's probably too many people making things for people seeing it through a different lens than the people who need to use that infrastructure. Um, so true. So something that I would see potentially as safe and easy and to walk on my own or to w run up some stairs or get to, to somewhere would be completely different from someone from one of those um, groups. So once again, it goes back to how do we get people like children and, and things involved with a lens to look at the infrastructure we're building and doing in the, the streets and roads and streets framework, different things about making sure that those people are involved in the decision making because if we don't involve them, then they're immediately not going to be involved with the infrastructure. Great, great point. Can I just, just we were, add on um, that as well? One, one yeah. thing, the equity point is really, really important that um, when, if you map where uh, pedestrian injuries occur, they're at a higher level in South Auckland, particularly for children. And the Safe Kids um, team who've done a paper in the in NZMJ recently show that as well as having a higher chance of being injured there, the number of speed calming devices is lower. So we've got a, a clear sort of link between cause and effect in terms of if we're not slowing speeds around schools and where the children are in South Auckland, we're going to have more injuries there. That's what we've got. So if we want equity, we need to invest there. Okay, brilliant. I mean, so uh, we were out yesterday in Glen Innes actually with my team walking around, and I don't know if you've been to Glen Innes, but there's a really fantastic cycleway which ends in the central city, in the uh, town centre, comes in through a, a sort of subway. I mean, it's, it's frightening absolutely frightening underneath the railway tracks and there's a few lights and a few buzzes and uh, it's, it's scary stuff, you know, even it's scary in the daytime and I just thought these are little simple things we need to be tackling quickly and getting these done. So um, th those are some really great answers. Um, in, you mentioned uh, um, roads and streets framework. We've got um, number one, 17 people have, have liked this one. I've, I have hope for Auckland from what I'm hearing tonight um, is what the, the person's asked. Um, with all these people here talking about healthy streets, when will AT ratify the roads and streets framework and enable healthy streets and do more good work like they're doing? So, that's a question. Um, so, the transport design manual, which is yep, yep. comes We're under that umbrella, um, it's been on development for quite some time, yeah. but it's going through a final review and we hope to have it ratified before the urban streets part of it. Ratified yeah, the street before design Christmas. guides part, yeah. 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 Great, yeah. Th thank you. So, um, will Auckland Council and Auckland Transport's criteria for community... Oh, it's just gone off. Will Auckland Council and Auckland Transport's criteria for community consultation include, from 2018 onwards, health impacts and benefits? Hard one to answer that one. That's pretty high up on the, address, on the agenda. So, will Auckland Council and Auckland Transport's criteria for community consultation include, from 2018 onwards, health impacts and benefits? Um, I don't know, maybe that's something you could answer or try to. <laughs> I can ask. I'm one vote. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure we look at some lens of it, but not in the kind of holistic way that Lucy's talking about, but we could easily, I could easily, Shane could easily, we could all easily push for that, and um, I don't see why not. It's not, it's not a s silly idea, and I don't yeah. see how it could cost much either, if that was a limitation. Okay. 
Um, wonderful to see AT CEO sitting next to a public health professional. How does AT consult with the health community and how is that feedback incorporated? That's a hard one. You might be a bit new on the job, but I don't know. Oh, well. You might oh, know it already. Um, so we have some linkages with yeah. the health community. Some of you may know we have, we've been fortunate to have three uh, directors on AT who are also been previously or concurrently directors of district yep. health boards. Yep. Um, and that influence has obviously been there. Been fortunate enough to have uh, Healthy Auckland together and Michael came along to one of our executive team meetings and okay. talked about that. Okay. Um, and that was quite insightful. And I, I still remember one of the facts that came out of that around uh, the level of obesity, how much change there'd been in terms of adult obesity in New Zealand between 1977 and today, and it's and it's increased from about 10% to over 30%, I think, Michael. So, um, so those linkages Crazy. are there, but we need to do more. Um, it's it's something that you know yeah. we're starting to appreciate a lot more, but we need to kind of have that spread through the organisation. Thank you. That, that's great. Shall we um, have a? Oh, someone's pointing at the watch. Okay. Um, let's just uh, one more question on on here. Um, um, how about a question from the floor? Is there, there's, a, there's a hand up. Is there any, where, are the, where are the microphones, guys, or am I causing a problem there? Let, here's one. Let's go for this in the middle there. I, I, I just wondered, uh, within Auckland Transport and Auckland Council, um, you know, I hear about designing for the extremes, that is, the old people like me, <laughs> and also the infants and children. And the city center has someplace well over 40,000 people living in it, but not a lot of children. And I wonder if the children being most vulnerable, that is they're shorter, um, do you have a way of measuring? Are you, are you looking at air pollution from the large number of diesel buses. Is there a way, because those diesel buses often discharge at the lowest level where the little kids are walking on the footpaths. So, so sir, there's a bunch of questions within that one. I mean, there's, there's, is there, there's, there a way, is there a way to measure it? And are you measuring it? Well, we, we have to start measuring. And uh, the mayor last year was in, in Paris um, as part of a, a C40 um, mayor's climate um, session with um, Michael Bloomberg that, that, that established that. And um, he signed a, uh, an agreement around emissions free zone uh, within the downtown um, city center of Auckland, which a lot of us are very excited about because that has a that sounds um, at one level quite esoteric, but what that means is, um, I mean, Shane's team are going to be buying only electric buses going forward. Um, there's an opportunity. Um, uh, might might not just be electric. Okay, so <laughs> it might be some other fossil fuel fossil free. Fossil fuel free. That's the, in fact that's the better word. It's called a fossil free emission zone. So it's a it's a complex word. So. Do you want to maybe a bit more on that, yeah. Shane? Yeah, no, so we have a, we have a roadmap which, uh, to move forward to meet that. Yeah. Um, we have two electric buses, as most of you know, uh, operating at the moment on the City Link. We're looking at more trials and uh, engaging with other cities such as Christchurch, Wellington. Um, we have quite a challenge in front of us to meet that, but we are committed to doing it. Um, and it's quite exciting in terms of noise, in yeah. terms of emissions, in terms of you know making the city a pleasant place to be. Yeah, that's great. And does Richard do you want to say anything about that? Or? No, I mean just we should be doing more of it. But I also want to say we have lots of kids in the city centre, and it's growing dramatically. The reason often why you don't see them is because it's not a safe place often to be for kids. But um, and we need to act faster on that because I see. On the shore, there's lots of kids that come with parents on their bus, on the bus from the shore um, every day, and they obviously go to school or childcare centre um, within the city while the parents are at work and things. And um, yeah. yeah, my little nephew was born three weeks ago, and he, they live in an apartment in Ponsonby, so we've got to make sure that's right for him as well, please. 
So, yeah, the, the issue of children is really important as well. And uh, if you think about the success of the Wynyard Quarter and the, the children's playground, I mean, there's 52,000 people living in downtown Auckland now. In 1991, there was 1,800. It's a, a very different place. And uh, there are lots of mums and dads and families and lots of younger children around. And, um, you know, we're looking at ways we can build streets and make them into parks. There's a, there's a real journey around moving from tarmac into green space. So the Victoria Linear Park is a two-kilometre-long parkway, which we're looking at building from Albert Street, Albert Park, all the way through to Wynyard. So there's a lot of things that we are doing, maybe a new school in downtown. Um, for children, so there's a whole range of things we have to start thinking about. So, for, thank you for your question, sir. I think um, we, we've, I've been, we've been told that the time is up, but look, I want to thank the panelists and, and for their, their time tonight. Uh, thank you for your questions on, 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 the, on the app. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Richard to um, give the vote of thanks, uh, to thank Lucy and the team for coming all the way. Lucy, thank you on behalf of my team. I know you've got a lot of time you're going to be spending with my team over the next few days, and you have been. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Shane, thank you. That, thank you to the team, Michael and Richard. So, thank you very much, everyone. Richard. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think it's been a good, but it feels like rather quick um, night, but I know conversations will be continuing on um, after this and on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, no one talks like this on Facebook, so just Twitter. Um, the, just want to thank uh, Ludo for running this evening, and Lucy, I think um, you gave us some real insight into what we need to be doing now um, really quickly and we thank you so much for coming here and I hope you get more than two hours off in your time in New Zealand to do some um, fun things. Also thank you Shane and Michael for being on the panel um, and thank you for the to the Auckland Conversations team and Auckland Transport and Buffer Miskel and there's uh, South based construction, Resine. Uh, am I supposed to be thinking? Okay, cool. <laughs> Architectural Designers New Zealand, New Zealand Planning Institute, New Zealand Institute of Architects Incorporated, NZ Green Building Council, MR Cagney, Brookfields Lawyers. Um, I probably missed things. Uh, thank you to Lisa for opening up for us. Um, yeah, I think it's a good conversation that's pretty obvious to most of you in this room that we need to be doing this work. There is um, a lot of good work happening. Um, just finished, gone through the Auckland plan uh, refresh, which is a lot of good stuff in there, the roads and streets framework, which we just need to be taking, moving forward, improving, um, moving on. Obviously ATAP and the 10 year budget and working with our new, not new, not so new anymore, but the government um, together on this issue, I know Julianne Genta announced um, a few weeks ago around uh, looking at South Auckland and the issues there and how we can improve stuff really fast. Um, and I think it is absolutely important for all of us to be working in this space. But all of you, but as an elected member, um, keep doing your work too because we often only hear from the please don't do and the please don't change and please um, save my car park and... Um, so it would be really, really good, not that those voices are important, but it's please can you all speak up too, speak up um, around these important things because it is hard to change things and it's, change is hard for everyone, but if we have a mix of voices from all backgrounds and all situations, then we actually start changing things and it's with the community and we can, you know, hand on heart say that, oh, the community does want this, um, so that is my wish to you and we will... Um, do better. So thank you very much and have an awesome night and travel safe home um, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>